want you to just chunk this down and think, okay, these are things, number one, I can practice, but then I can integrate. Now, with that being said, let me kind of break down the very end of this. P and F, one last area. This is not in your Therix text as, as these two are. I'm sorry, those two are. This one right here, this one is not necessarily in your Therix text. But this is really good stuff that you've got to just kind of take and swallow because it is in your neurotech. Please think about how your developmental sequence would occur. And I'm saying like from an infant stage. You're going to learn this when you do pediatrics next semester. But what we're going to tell you then is that babies, they progress from supine. You lay a baby down, and the first thing they start to learn how to do is they will start to pick up their legs. And then they'll start doing things with their legs and their arms, and they'll lift their head. And as they start to progress, they'll roll. And when they roll, then they'll start to develop extension of the head in a greater format. So they supine, they hook lock, they roll. And then as they get pretty good prone, they lift up their head and they're up on their elbows. And then they kind of will squirm a little bit with a commando crawl. Now, hang on, I'm going to go back through all these. Just, just, And then they start getting up on quadruped. You know what that looks like. And then they'll kind of come up to kneeling. And I'm going to go over on that mat here in a minute. I'm going to show you all these. And then they start sitting. They start sitting. And eventually they start getting protective reach where they're here and then they kind of can here and then they develop anterior strength where it's, they're no longer falling backwards and then they start to scoot a little bit and before you know it they're walking around this is called cruising right here you've probably all seen kids do this before they finally get off to that right there right that's a developmental sequence. Now, this is not pediatrics talk. It's just not. What I want to do is I want to extend this over into maybe geriatrics. Maybe they're deconditioned. Maybe they're um, CVAs. Maybe they're MS, Parkinson's. Who knows what? You have to know this sequence so that you can say, this is where they're at, this is where I start. You see, when we talk stability, I think a lot of times you think, okay, we're going to learn how to do eccentric, concentric, isometric, done. you got to take these concepts right here and know why we're doing them. you got to know where to go with them. And this is one of the best, like, methods of kind of executing that. And it's really not that difficult when you see it. And then in a few weeks when we do balance, we're going to basically revisit this whole sequence again. Because balance is step A, B, C, D, E. F, G, H, and once they get to H, they're doing pretty good. Because the next step from sit to stand is standing and then walking. And that's exactly the sequence you're going to see in level of difficulty. So I'm going to come over here to the mat. So just kind of pivot for me. you're doing cranial nerves 
on old Linda's tiny tops at French and German Pizza Pops. It was the very first thing I wrote when I sat down to take my licensure exam on my brain dump paper. I had one cranial nerve question. <laughs> I didn't need on old Lucas Tiny Tops of French and German Beats and Mops. It was crazy simple. But yours may not be. You may have 16. Um, Alright. So, a supine progression. Here's what we're saying. Does the patient have the ability to do this, then advance, then advance, then advance, then advance. Starting with supine progression, it says... Oh gosh, okay, I can read it. Hook line to bridging, and then we scoot. What is all that for? That's for bed mobility. Think about your lowest level patients. They need bed mobility. Do you remember in physical disabilities when we talked about people who are in the bed a lot, they develop a risk for pressure ulcers, right? And so they need bed mobility. They need bed mobility so that they can get to the edge of bed so they can transfer maybe to the bedside commode or to a toilet. They need bed mobility so that they can get to the edge of bed and then get dressed or get to their walker or get to their food or just keep going down the list. But they need bed mobility. So if you ever have bed mobility as a goal for a patient, and you will, shoot this picture right here because you have a skills check coming next semester in rehab where it's going to say improve bed mobility. I'm telling you, I have the master list. <laughs> I've seen it. Bed mobility is on there. I'm giving you what you can do. Because did you notice how Ms. Hobbe says, show me five things to do this in her skills check? Here's a couple. Supine progression. Supine. Can the patient do this? Right there. That's step one of bed mobility. Step two of bed mobility, can they bridge? Now listen, this is what a true bridge should look like. Right here. There should be hyperextension in the lumbar spine. We know that all our patients can't do that. We know that. But can they do that right there? And then can they scoot? Scooting does not mean sliding. That's a bridge and a scoot. This is bed mobility. That's a supine progression. Next on the supine progression is, can they roll? Now, what I want you to understand is that rolling requires one leg and one arm to be somewhat out of the way so that when they do roll, right? Again, is this bed mobility? Yes, it is. Also, would you mind just taking a look for me at my left arm laying here in D1 extension moving to D1 flexion anybody else catch that and the movements that are required for rolling very much mimic the movements that are required for gait and that's listed up there underneath and so when a patient can is appropriate to do rolling, or if they have bed mobility goals or they have gait goals, rolling should definitely be part of your interventions. Absolutely should be. And notice what I did with my arm and what I did with my leg is I got them out of the way so that I could roll. Do you see them? Arms out of the way. Sometimes you've heard it said to roll a patient like I don't know if you're doing CPR, you gotta get this arm up right here. I'm not trying to take away from CPR training. What I'm trying to do is say, in therapy, what you're doing is you're just getting the arm here. There's D1 flexion, right? 
that's where it comes in. But they have to have the ability to integrate the whole body into rolling. The next one is a prone progression. Now, what they should be able to do is supine, hook lie. They should be able to bridge. They should be able to roll. And they should be able to roll to prone. Now, not a lot of people roll to prone like this. <laughs> they usually get their arms here and they go to prone on elbows. Like this right here. Not a lot of people can do this. In fact, it probably is safe to say that somebody in this room can't do this. This is not an easy skill, and it's one that's lost very quickly. And so if they can't, this is where you start. When we talk Therax 2, the very first place we start is with the lumbar spine. And one of our very first things is teaching a patient to go prone on elbows. That's what this is called. When you look up there, you see POE. That's prone on elbows. What's the next progression, Donisa? Uh huh. So, what is that? It's a progression, though, folks. Okay? And then it progresses back down. That's a commando crawl. Bed mobility? Yes. Gate goals? Yes. And when we do gate later in the semester, you're going to say, I see that now. Absolutely something I could do. Yeah, because I don't see that right now. I know. It's okay. I've just been saying that to myself. But... Yeah, how do you get gate from rolling? Well, the biggest thing here is You've got to know what deficits exist in gait. And you don't know those yet because we haven't covered gait yet. So when we do, one of the things that we'll talk about is they sometimes can't lift in hip flexion, which is pretty important, right? Possibly they don't have enough rotation. And I'm, I'm kind of exaggerating this so that you can see it. So rolling facilitates into gait <coughs> by that, by that, right? And it does it in an anti-gravity position or a gravity independent position. So just wait on it. It's coming. The next one is moving from prone to quadruped. And so what does that look like? That's here, and that's having upper body strength. Now, all of you are able to do this, but I want you to consider some of your patients who weren't. And that is that right there. Now you think, it's no big deal. And to you, it may not be. But to your patient, going from prone to quadruped is a big deal. It also works into bed mobility, and it also works into gait. It's very low level. It's also great for upper body strength. Because think about the uh, isometric component of my upper body right now. Right? And also, I could come in and do some rhythmic stabilization. I could come in and work on that scapula. What am I doing here, Donisa? That's right. And then I could facilitate the scapular movements of it where I couldn't when they were laying supine. <coughs> and I can't cross midline. but my pelvis doesn't work that much either, right? And then from here, it says I could also just take an arm up. 
What's this called? Okay. Yeah. And so I can challenge in different ways, right? Um, take a look at my hips and my shoulders. Ms. Hobday will talk to you about joint approximation. This should have already popped up in procedures too, if it hasn't. Joint approximation is very much like joint compression. We talked about joint compression a few weeks ago in this class. That is when the joint space decreases. Joint approximation is the same thing, only it's with intention. And what we're doing is we're compressing that joint and the sensory information that you're learning about in neuro through joint receptors is going crazy in the brain. Now, some of you are like, where does that really come in? Well, Donisa, how well did you do when I put one hand on the front of your shoulder, one hand on the back of your shoulder, and I started pushing, and you were like, I don't, I don't even know what to do. It was crazy difficult, wasn't it? Yeah. Hold your positions. Don't move. Here's another technique. It's not up there, but I just want to share with you so I can get some buy-in. Tell me what letter I just wrote on your back. Yeah. Good. Tell me what letter I just wrote on your back. Good. Tell me what letter I just wrote on your back. Mm -hmm. Are you sure? No. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Tell me what letter I wrote on your back. Why? I wrote a V. Oh. But she did pretty good. She did pretty good. We had a patient in here last spring. It was actually my father-in-law. He could get three out of every 10 that you wrote on his back. What is that? That's this thing in house in your skull, trying to talk to this area right here. It's called graphesthesia. Same process when I go like this right here, right? And for most of you, rhythmic stabilization is no big deal. But for him, it was a very big deal. It usually lasted about 20 seconds right here. And then it was usually right here. And then it ultimately he would end up right here. What are we saying here? We're saying strength, endurance. We're saying your brain talking through sensory integration. That's what this whole <coughs> conversation is about today. We also move um, and I want to say this, and that's strength, endurance, balance, but also I have there the initial AI. Any thoughts on what that must mean? Is the nominate a part of it? No, that is a good one, though. I want to think. Quadruple. artificial intelligence. <laughs> Anterior? Anterior. Isometric. No. <laughs> I'm thinking of a plank. Huh? Anterior, Anterior isolation? Oh, no. Come on with it. Alternating <laughs> isometrics. Alternating isometrics. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Right? I mean, this is a great position to incorporate alternating isometrics in. Right here. Um, and then we move to kneeling. What is kneeling? We move from here to here. This is the first position where we actually have weight bearing through the spine, into the hips, and into the knees. It says that um, 
This is also great for an extension synergy. This hobby has probably not covered that yet. That comes along with CBAs and DBIs. They'll develop an extension synergy where that knee is an extension and then the foot, or I'm sorry, the ankle is in plantar flexion. And so when we see those patients, <coughs> we want to get them kneeling a lot because again, that joint weight bearing position is very, very responding to, uh, or I'm sorry, I said that wrong. The synergy is very responding to a weight bearing position. Um, and then this will progress to this. This is known as half kneeling. However, this is a much safer, more balanced position because if they get tired, they're probably not going to fall forward. They're not going to fall to the side. You know what they're going to do? That right there. This, however, if you have a knee and a hip, balance-wise, this is a much more challenging position. And then we move to sitting. Now I want to show you the proper way to sit. Right here. Feet flat on the floor, hands to the side. This opens up the intervention known as weight shift. I weight shift right, I weight shift left, I weight shift right, I weight shift left. We don't bring those chairs over for our patients to weight shift in. We don't weight shift off of the stools. We weight shift off a table very such like this right here. Okay. And so there's our weight shift. And then it says the pelvis, spine. I can't read my writing from here. What's the next word, Noah? I think it says neutral. Neutral, yes, thank you, sorry. Pelvis and a neutral spine. Neutral spine will come up in Therix too, and that means that you don't have a flexed lumbar spine with a big kyphosis, and you don't have a hyperlordotic spine, but rather you have a neutral spine. And that means you're sitting on your ischial tubes. <coughs> so I'm going to pick on somebody who was kind of leaned back in their sacral sit this morning with their leg crossed. And I said, everybody get good posture. And I saw this. <laughs> However, this right here has to come here. Posture starts at the pelvis, period. You cannot change that. And that means the ischial tubes are the contact point, not the sacrum. If the sacrum is, there's no lumbar lordosis and there's a posterior pelvic tilt. When you anterior your pelvic tilt and you sit on your ischial tubes, that's why posture has to start at the pelvis. Okay. And you're gonna have to prompt that. I was gonna say, we'll get this in Canadian too. It's that important. Scooting, the next one. Scooting is an intervention. They need to be able to scoot. And to do that, they have to weight shift over and then move that side that is de-weighted. Okay, let me say that again. You have to weight shift and then move the side that's de-weighted. That's part of scooting right there. Uh, it's a semantic question, but earlier you said scooting was like picking up and moving, and now we're stopping. But we're yep. still calling it scooting. Well, but look, here. Okay. It's the move. Picking that. That's the key. Yep. Okay. Okay. All right. So you are de-weighting, elevating. It's subtle. Yeah. But you have to move that way. Okay. So it's still consistent with yeah. the bridging technique. I'm just really having to show you a high lift to yeah. get you there. Um, the pelvis has to rotate in that instance. So that requires a little bit of rotation. And then, where's that going? That's going to the sit to stand. Um, 
Sky, you were with Deanna, correct? Deanna is one of the best people I've ever seen at instructing the sit to stand uh, because she does it a lot. And so that means that they have to scoot forward in their chair, okay? That they don't want to come so far in the chair that they're at risk of falling out of their chair. But they do have to scoot, which means that they have to weight shift, weight shift, weight shift to the front. They're going to get their center of gravity above their base of support. And to do that, they usually have to lean forward. And that gets them the momentum to come up in a sit to stand position. The question is, what do you do with their hands? They're either on the armrests, on their knees, or if they're advanced and strong, they have none. But it is also very widely accepted for them to put their hands on their knees and to push. It is widely accepted to put their hands on armrests and push. But did you see that I scooted forward I lean forward, got my center of gravity over my base of support. Base of support, you don't know that term yet. Maybe you do. What is it? Connected to the ground. It is. And very commonly, what is that practically? The feet. It's the feet. So my center of gravity, which is a... The spot where all your planes intersect. Uh-huh. And it's dynamic, it changes has to move forward over my base of support so that I can stand safely. And that's really where we hit the pause button and say, when we resume, it's because we're in balance and balance is integral to gait, which is the next step, which is walking. And that's the developmental sequence. What does it say after weight shift slash scoot slash scoot? After scoot. Hang on. I'm going to have to look. What is that? Bad mobility? Like it says lean. lean. Oh, lean. L-E-A-N, sorry. That's, I was saying lean over there. I just didn't, just didn't follow it on my... I didn't follow it on my... 